Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the ABL Group Maritime Market Briefing for March 2023. Uh, my name is Mark McGurran. I'm the Global Managing Director for Maritime here at ABL Group. Um, this month, we're going to be talking about uh, private yachts. Oh, it's not working. There we go. Um, so our briefing this morning is accredited by the Chartered Insurance Institute and delegates can claim up to one CPD hour for your participation. We will therefore keep a record of those of you in the room today and those of you logging, on, logging in online. If you hadn't already done so, please make sure you sign in um, with the team on the desk outside after the briefing so that they're able to receive your follow-up emails and sort out the CPD accreditation if that's needed. I'm delighted to introduce our technical presenters today. Adam Jackson will be doing the technical yacht part of our presentation. Adam is the head of ABL Yachts and he's, he's recently joined us from the MCA. Whereas the head of yachts there, he was responsible for the MCA Large Yacht Code and for all large yachts on the UK flag. Adam is a naval architect and a chartered marine engineer. Following that, Jasper Gaskin will be giving the case reports. Jasper, who most of you might recognize by now, is one of our engineers in our engineer development program, and he has a master's in mechanical engineering, which he graduated from last year. As usual, the usual caveats apply, Chatham House rules apply and please remember that the information contained in today's presentations and any opinions or comments expressed are those of the presenters and not necessarily those of ABL. Uh, to help us keep what we what we deliver to you guys relevant we would ask you please if you've got time to fill out the um, questionnaire the survey uh, which can be uh, found by scanning this this QR code or it's also outside on the desk um, this is very important for us, not only because it allows us to um, tailor our, our, our presentations to what you guys want, but it's also critical for keeping our CPD accreditation. Before I hand over to our technical presenter, I would ask you again to give a few moments thought to the seafaring men and women at sea today, uh, even though COVID-19, certainly here in the UK, seems to be increasingly in the rear view mirror. Uh, seafarers are still often working longer than they are meant to due to crew change issues. There are also a lot of other factors going on in the world which impact adversely the lives and conditions of seafarers. Many of our own colleagues and the team here at ABL have a seafaring background and we consider ourselves seafarers to this day. So crew welfare is a cause that is close to our hearts. As such, ABL Group is proud to be a signatory of the Neptune Declaration, which has undoubtedly played a part in many improvements, including providing vaccinations for all seafarers and implementing health protocols for safe crew changes. Please take a moment to look at this if you have time and perhaps consider getting your own company to sign up if possible. And now over to you, Adam. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for coming today. Um, a super yacht is unique. It's one of the single most expensive items a person can buy for themselves. And once purchased, it's usually operated in an uncontrolled and harsh environment where risk is inherently high. So who is actually responsible for the safety of a super yacht? If it is commercially operated, then as far as the international shipping community is concerned, it is categorized as a cargo ship and it is regulated accordingly, the same as any other cargo ship. But what if it's not commercial? What if the owner has no desire to charter their pride and joy out to strangers? Who is responsible then to make sure the yacht is safe? The builder? The crew? The country whose flag it's flying? Class? Well, ultimately, it is the owner. If someone wants to spend $500 million on their own private yacht, then they can do whatever they want with it. And it's up to them to make sure it's operated safely. So what's the problem? The problem is that a $500 million yacht needs close to 100 people permanently employed to work on it. It needs specialist marina facilities. It needs regular refit and daily maintenance work. And it represents a huge insurance risk. So is it enough to just place the responsibility onto the owner?
so the uh, learning points for today as our uh, maritime market briefings are CPD credit accredited it's an important criteria to run through our learning objectives for today so following this technical presentation you will understand the legal definition of a pleasure vessel under maritime law you will gain an understanding of how the various shipping conventions apply to these vessels you'll be able to des describe the risks associated with these large yachts and appreciate that the risk is higher for a private yacht than it is for a commercial yacht and you will understand what the right questions are to ask when in when considering insuring these vessels so let us begin by defining exactly what we are talking about here a pleasure vessel is legally defined internationally as this but for our purposes we only really need to focus on these lines so a pleasure vessel is any vessel which at the time it is being used is only for the sport or pleasure of the owner or their immediate family and friends and is on a voyage or excursion for which the owner does not receive any money for a commercial yacht is not actually dis defined anywhere in regulation instead it's simply any yacht that does not meet that definition a private yacht is the same as a pleasure vessel and a pleasure vessel engaged in trade is of course a commercial vessel a commercial yacht and in the yacht world that pretty much means it's a charter yacht historically the international shipping regulators the IMO and the ILO have avoided applying mandatory regulations to recreational or private boating why maybe it was thought that recreational boating would only usually occur on small boats within a country's own waters and so there was no real need for international regulation maybe there was never a thought that private boats would get so big whatever the reason what this means is that under most international maritime rules pleasure vessels are exempt and it is the flag state that must determine rules covering these vessels but many countries do not regulate private vessels when they are outside of their own waters there is an unspoken assumption from flag states that these vessels are being looked after by their owners or by their insurers looking at these yachts it's hard to believe that they are privately owned and used solely for the pleasure of their owners families or friends and so meet the legal definition of a pleasure vessel now to be clear yachts like dilbar eclipse azam and nord are huge investments and have multidisciplinary owner and management teams in place they also usually comply voluntarily with all applicable regulations for a vessel of this size or 5000 gt plus as though it was a commercial yacht these will be very safe and are not really a concern potential financial exposure is huge but the crew will be highly competent and at the top of their game and the yacht will be maintained in a near perfect condition and the risk of an incident is reduced accordingly so it doesn't really matter from a safety risk perspective how these yachts are categorized by the international community but voluntary is a key word that you may have picked up on owners of the much larger yachts can afford to keep their investments in tip-top condition and voluntarily comply with rules that do not apply to them but what about the smaller yachts they're still super yachts and they're still worth millions of pounds they're still operating worldwide with a paid crew my experience is that for a lot of these vessels if there is an opportunity to save money on something that is not mandated the owner will take it this might be through ignorance or through receiving skewed information from employees eager to please it doesn't really matter why but the fact remains the vast majority of super yachts between 24 meters and 60 meters 
that do not operate commercially do not choose voluntary compliance with any shipping standard. And we're not just talking about older yachts. A builder of high volume series yachts, such as this one here, will offer the option to the buyer. Do you want your yacht to be private or commercial? And there will be a price saving associated if you pick the private option. And for a yacht this size, that price saving is somewhere in the region of three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars. If the owner doesn't want to charter their vessel, then they will usually choose the cheaper private option. And those people who will benefit from the sale will not invest too much energy in explaining that by going private, the safety standard is reduced and the builder is able to avoid most regulatory controls over the build process. That $300,000 saved in the build process is a direct result of reducing the safety standards of the yacht. So there'll be less fire protection. There'll be less stability. There'll be less safety equipment. And if the owner knew this, would they be so keen to save the money? Moving on to the shipping conventions. These are the international documents that define all maritime regulation. Compliance with these regulations minimizes the risk of shipping by among other things, mandating safety standards, fire protection, stability requirements, pollution prevention methods, and training standards of crew. They've been developed over decades in response to maritime casualties and other learning opportunities. Now we will consider how these conventions, the backbone of, in, of international shipping regulations, apply to our private yachts. Safety of Life at Sea, or SOLAS, is the main convention written by the IMO and almost globally adopted by every flag state. SOLAS provides international requirements for life-saving appliances, firefighting, construction, stability, safety management, security, radio, and navigation. It focuses on, in, on ensuring safety of life. The section on safety of navigation, chapter five, does apply to all internationally operating ships. But in general, SOLAS does not apply to pleasure vessels not engaged in trade. So the international requirement for carrying life jackets, fire extinguishers, a lifeboat, or having a strong enough hull to keep the water out doesn't apply to private yachts. Standards of training, certification, and watchkeeping for seafarers, STCW, is the convention that ensures seafarers are properly trained for their role, but it does not apply to pleasure vessels not engaged in trade. So the international regulation that states how a captain should be qualified does not apply. Load line is the convention that covers the safe loading of a vessel, its stability and freeboard, and it does not apply to pleasure vessels not engaged in trade. The rule that says you shouldn't have any holes in your boat that might let the water in does not apply to private yachts. The Maritime Labour Convention, MLC, protects the rights of seafarers as employees and it does not apply to seafarers employed on ships not ordinarily engaged in commercial activities. So those working on private yachts. The rule that says you have to pay someone for doing their job and that they can only work 14 hours a day and that they can only be made to work every day for a maximum of 11 months continuously, it doesn't apply. Marple. This convention aims to protect the marine environment and does not differentiate by anything operating within it. It applies to all vessels operating in the marine environment and so equally applies to pleasure vessels. If you are over 400 gross tons, you must be surveyed, but only to ensure that you are not polluting. And tonnage. This convention does apply to any vessel engaged on an international voyage, and it includes the requirement for a survey. 
flag states usually require evidence of this survey before registering a vessel. However, it's important to note that a tonnage survey is just that. It is often done remotely using a drawing and it's limited to measuring the internal volume only to assign a tonnage vessel, uh, value to the vessel. Condition of the vessel is entirely out of scope of a tonnage survey. A yacht could be falling apart and still have a successful tonnage survey. So in conclusion, the shipping community largely ignores pleasure vessels not engaged in trade and the seafarers who work on them, except where pollution is a risk. This shifts the burden of responsibility for regulating these vessel types onto countries whose flags they fly and port states that they visit. The UK MCA, up in the top corner there, does have rules governing pleasure vessels over 13.7 metres. These rules focus on firefighting equipment, manning levels and life-saving appliances. But they are rules that are, in practice, only applied in UK waters. I'm not sure many people in the super yacht industry even know about them. There are no rules mandating a flag inspection or a survey for a private yacht on the UK flag. A private yacht of any size may register on the UK flag without the need for an inspection. In fact, registering a private yacht, a private vessel is now an online process requiring no personal interaction with, with the UK registry at all. If you're over 400 gross tons, then you will need to arrange a MARPOL survey, but nobody's checking that. And remember, a MARPOL survey car carried out by a MARPOL surveyor will specifically and deliberately only look at pollution risks. It is not a general safety inspection. The Cayman Islands are a little cleverer when it comes to their private yachts, large, large private yachts. A Cayman Island surveyor must attend every over 400 gross ton private yacht on the Cayman Island fleet annually to carry out the MARPOL survey. And at this visit, they usually will carry out a general flag state inspection to look at the overall condition. And if the yacht seems unsafe, it will be stopped. Those yachts under 400 gross tons, if they do not choose voluntary compliance with the yacht code, then there are no requirements for inspection or survey under the Cayman Islands flag. Malta has no requirements for large private yachts operating outside of Maltese waters. Again, MARPOL surveys are delegated to somebody else. And the Marshall Islands, if a, if a private yacht is classed, then there is no need for a survey before registration. If it is not classed, then the yacht must be inspected by a surveyor before registration. Once registered, there's no further survey requirements. Port state. Normally, a port state can inspect any vessel in their waters against the international shipping requirements to check to make sure they are safe, not polluting, and have the right people aboard. If not, they can be detained. This is a great method of controlling and regulating international shipping. However, port state control inspections do not include in their scope pleasure vessels not engaged in trade. So these vessels, regardless of the flag they fly in, are not automatically subject to inspection when arriving in a foreign port. So what about class? Surely all big yachts are classed. Yacht classification is voluntary. In the class instructions, it states that the flag state will ask for classification of yachts used for commercial service. We already know that. The term commercial service is defined in a variety of ways by different flag states. And we have defined it earlier. Basically, anything that is not a pleasure vessel. So as far as class are concerned, the owner and flag state will determine whether classification is required for yachts. They have, and in the case of private yachts, it is not. It's also important to note that the classification of a vessel refers only to hull and machinery, the physical attributes of a vessel. Safety, manning, navigation, fire protection, 
none of these aspects of, flat, flat, of, of a yacht's operation are within scope for a class society unless they are specifically delegated this task by flag. And no flag state, as far as I am aware, specifically delegates the application of national safety rules for the operation of a pleasure vessel to class. So let me summarize the risks. The risks inherent in shipping are addressed and mitigated through international regulation that applies to all commercial ships. These regulations aim to improve fire safety, provide for competent, well-trained and certificated crew, improve safety of life at sea, protect the marine environment and ensure ships are strong enough and stable enough for the environment they operate in. If your vessel is not commercial, then most of these international regulations do not apply to you. There is no regulation that mitigates fire risk. There is no regulation that provides for life-saving equipment like a life jacket or a life raft. There is no regulation that says you should fit sprinklers. There is no regulation that says how your captain should be qualified. There is no regulation that says your vessel should be strong enough to withstand the force of the sea or stable enough to stay afloat in it. We have seen that if you're in some countries' waters like the UK, then there are regulations. If you are in others, like the Caribbean or the Eastern Mediterranean, maybe not. But we've also seen that nobody is going to check. I'd like to run through a brief case study. Let's take a 399 gross ton GRP yacht, so fiberglass yacht, and assess its general suitability for an Atlantic crossing. You have been approached by the assured, requesting continued cover for the crossing. What should you ask? The passage is likely to take around 10 days and cover 3,000 nautical miles. The trip is planned during good weather, but there's always the possibility that some extreme weather events may occur regardless of the time of year. I'd like to compare the risks for a commercial yacht and a private yacht. Firstly, we will consider a commercial yacht. So question number one, is it commercially registered? Yes. With a reputable fl uh, flag, let's say the Cayman Islands, great. Has it been built in accordance with rules for this range of operation? Yep. It has to have been built to the REG Yacht Code standards for it to get commercially registered. And at 399 gross tons, it will be designed for unlimited operation. Will it remain afloat if the hull is damaged during the passage? It should. It has been assessed for damage survivability and this has been approved by the flag state. Is it equipped for unlimited operation? Yeah, it must have all the right radio, life-saving and firefighting equipment for such a crossing. Is it manned with crew certificated as competent for such a crossing? Yes. It must meet its approved safe manning document that is relevant for its area of operation. Has it been surveyed to make sure it's safe? Yep, every year by flag state and separately by class, it's a requirement of the certification. And is it classed? Yep, that's a requirement of the large yacht code. So is it safe to undertake an Atlantic crossing? Definitely. Now let's consider the same vessel, but private and proposing the same voyage. So question one, is it commercially registered? No, but it is pleasure registered with a reputable flag state. Unfortunately, we know that this means there may not be any national regulations applicable to it. Has it been built in accordance with the rules for this range of operation? Probably not. It depends on the yard and the advice the owner was given at build. The rules do not apply. So the hull may not be strong enough to handle Atlantic seas. Will it stay afloat if the hull is damaged during the passage? Probably not. Damage stability is expensive and it's difficult to achieve on a smaller yacht. And it inevitably limits the internal guest space and therefore the guest experience. If it is not required, it is unlikely to be considered. So the yacht may not remain afloat 
if the hull receives some damage. Is it equipped for unlimited operation? Again, probably not. For example, if you're not required to carry a rescue boat, you're very unlikely to do so voluntarily. They take up a lot of valuable deck space and they need annual serving, servicing and maintenance. Surely it must be manned with crew certificated as competent for such a crossing. Well, SCT STCW does not apply. And so it is entirely to the determination of the owner. If they think the crew are competent, then the requirement is met. If they have a favorite captain who they really like, and that person does not have a certificate for ocean crossings on this size of vessel, do you think they'll still use him? Yes, probably. Has someone surveyed this boat at some stage to make sure it's safe? Not necessarily. As we have seen, there are no survey requirements for private yachts of this size. It could be the untrained captain telling the owner that the boat is fine for the passage. Is it classed? Not necessarily. There's no requirement for this vessel to be classed. Even if it is, the safety equipment and crew standards are not within the scope of classification. They only consider hull and machinery. So is it safe to und undertake an Atlantic crossing? Well, I mean, probably. It is a good sized vessel and builders don't particularly want their yachts to have problems. Most captains, regardless of their qualification, are likely to be fairly sensible. Much smaller boats, on the bottom corner there, um, much smaller boats have crossed without issue and do so every year in good weather without an unlucky incident occurring, like hitting a partially submerged container, for example. But can an incident-free passage and good weather be guaranteed? No. So make sure the boat and crew can deal with whatever is thrown at them. Otherwise, the risk is too high. It's worth mentioning the EU's Recreational Craft Directive and the UK's Recreational Craft Regulations, which are applicable to all yachts sold on the EU and UK market. These rules introduce safety, stability, and structural requirements for yachts that are to be sold for recreational purposes. Think of it as a CE marking for small boats. It incorporates different categories of limitation on the vessel. So a category A RCD vessel is theoretically designed to operate in any, any sea state. So it should be designed with sufficient strength for crossing the Atlantic. However, the Recreational Craft Directive does not apply to vessels over 24 meters. So private yachts under 24 meters, not engaged in trade, are well regulated, at least in Europe. It's just the over 24 meter ones we need to worry about. Also, the EU Directive on the Insurance of Ship Owners for Maritime Claims 2009 requires all ships, including pleasure yachts not engaged in trade, to hold insurance if they're over 300 gross tons when operating out of any European port. So our big pleasure yachts must be insured. Even where a yacht is under 300 gross tons, there is usually a requirement at most marinas to have adequate insurance in place. For example, this fine nine meter vessel must be insured with third party liability cover in order for it to be allocated a marina berth. To get this insurance, I had to have this boat surveyed and they wouldn't let me do it myself. That's mine, by the way. So in conclusion, who can we rely on to ensure the safe condition and operation of large pleasure vessels, large pleasure yachts not engaged in trade. Some yacht management companies have suggested that this area is self-regulated and they have good control over the condition of these vessels. And I would agree for the yachts that engage a management company. But for a pleasure yacht not engaged in trade, there is absolutely no requirement to be formally managed. This requirement comes from the yacht codes and the conventions. How many big yachts choose to save a bit of money and external involvement by having the captain manage the boat? 
they can do the hiring of crew, planning the refits, arranging servicing. I would, I would estimate that less than a fifth of the 12,000 plus super yachts operating globally are formally managed. So we take them out of it. Some insurers have suggested to me that there is a reliance on reputable flag states ensuring a reasonable standard of safety, assuming they will be classed at the very least. If they are unsafe, then they would be not be permitted to operate. Unfortunately, this is not the case. As we have discovered, a pleasure yacht not engaged in trade of a certain size has absolutely no requirement to be classed or surveyed by anyone, ever. The likelihood of that vessel ever being subject to an official inspection is very low, even if it's involved in an incident. The only occasion where a vessel would not be permitted to operate by flag due to safety concerns would be if it was surveyed or inspected by flag and detained. If the yacht is overseas and private, this is not going to happen. And class do not stop vessels from operating. It is not in their remit or within their legal authority. So we take them out of it. Local authorities. A pleasure yacht not engaged in trade is not within the scope of port state control. So any opportunity to prevent it from sailing from a foreign port due to safety concerns is effectively lost. These yachts are not on the radar of most local authorities and a lot of owners like it this way. The industry is highly secretive. If you can avoid any external authority ever looking at your yacht, then all the better. Take them out of it. Most owners will not knowingly operate an unsafe yacht, especially with their families on board. But most owners are not maritime experts. And therefore, they may not know that their yachts are not as safe as they could be. Hit them out of it. Insurers are best placed, have the financial leverage, and can allocate resource to carry out condition surveys of vessels they insure. As a minimum takeaway from this presentation, it's important to understand that private yachts represent a higher risk than commercial yachts. I would suggest that all pleasure yachts not engaged in trade between 24 meters and 60 meters should be subject to a periodical survey as a requirement of a condition of cover. The scope should cover life-saving appliances, fire protection, crew competence and welfare, navigation and communication equipment, stability and strength as a minimum. And that's it. Thank you very much. Any questions, anybody? Yep. Good. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Sorry, I'm going to try and attempt to close this box a second way it is with me today okay good morning everyone um yeah uh welcome back to another market briefing um let me just get to the next slide so the purpose of this section of the briefing is uh simply to keep you updated on some of the recent higher cost incidents that abl have been involved in and in doing so show you or remind you of the sort of incidents and casualties that can happen in shipping and marine operations. But in case some of you haven't attended these briefings before, uh, you might be asking, what are these so-called case reports? Well, these feature largely, but not exclusively, hull and machinery casualties with estimated costs of repair in excess of quarter of a million dollars, usually excluding salvage costs. They cover only a subset of the total AVL group caseload, typically between 10 and 20% by case numbers. We've said about 10% in the past, but our ongoing review of 2022 statistics suggests actually about 18%. Regardless of the exact fraction of AVL business that they represent, these case reports are an important subset. For although they cover only about 20 to 25% of the whole machinery uh, cases we survey by number, 
They cover around actually 65 to 75% of the cases we survey by cost in H&M, that is. Treat with caution, though. Um, estimated costs are often preliminary and subject to further inspections um, and slash or investigations. So in presenting these case reports for the last month of activity, it's not about attributing blame. We just aim to convey what happened. So we won't be giving any definitive conclusions about the cause, as many of these cases are still quite fresh, uh, so it wouldn't be appropriate to do so. And in many cases, the cause is still under investigation anyway. Let's start with an update of the 2022 end of year statistics. As promised, we have been very busy reviewing the 2022 case reports to make sure we include any cases that perhaps did not meet the quarter of a million dollars mark uh, originally, but have since or that were missing for other reasons. We have an update on these numbers now, which means our total case reports for 2022 has increased from 161 cases to 205. There will be one final review of this next month where we will present our verified final numbers. Anyway, in this chart you have been looking at, you can see that taking into account these additional cases hasn't made a huge difference to the proportional distribution of the 2022 cases by number. The resulting revisions to the distributions by cost are a little bit more obvious, but again, not hugely so. And the revised overall average cost for the case report cases for 2022 is still very close to the $1 million mark. And finally on this update, when you compare the distributions by number and by cost together, you can see that machinery cases have become less significant by cost than by number, although the ratio hasn't reduced to the near 50% significance that we have uh, that we used to have regularly before the pandemic. Groundings and collisions have increased their significance by cost slightly, which also fits with normal expectations. Let's move on now to the usual statistics for the month just past. I've been notifi notified of only 10 high cost cases during February, and the blue columns in this graph show their proportional distribution by casualty type. Two machinery grounding cases, one each for fire and explosion, propulsion and, and structure, and three elision cases. As always, it's uh, with such a small sample set, you are bound to have gaps in the distribution that you see here when you compare it to the distribution for a whole year. In this case, the whole of 2022, given as the grey columns. Despite the small sample set, you can see that the distribution still reasonably follows what is, year on year, a fairly consistent trend, with the more frequently occurring casualty types being populated, at least. Now, here we've added in the distribution of those same 10 cases by their total costs. Note that the propulsion problem case this month, which, as we shall see, should really be shifted to the tail shaft category, accounts for about 50% of the total costs. Note, too, that this spike has suppressed the proportional uh, significance of the other casualty types, which is a bit of a weakness of this sort of graph. The total estimated cost for the 10 cases is about $10.5 million dollars. And that makes the average cost of the high cost cases for February just over $1 million. This is consistent with the typical annual background expected figure that we have seen over recent years when individual extreme cases of over $50 million are excluded. As we are still only two months into the new year, we won't start looking at any uh, cumulative figures for 2023 just yet. So. Let's move on now to look at some of the February cases in a little bit more detail. We've selected five of them, um, uh, if we have time to get through them all today. And please bear in mind that although we say these are February cases, the month generally refers to when the first advice comes in from our surveyor. Some of the cases, therefore, may actually be from earlier months. Okay, first up, we have this 12-year-old bolt carrier that suffered a failure of her number three generator engine while maneuvering to the inner anchorage of a far eastern port. 
after waiting 10 days at the outer anchorage for instructions to come in to load cargo. Not a particular problem. There were two other generators to provide electrical power. Water was seen coming out of the cylinder head of the auxiliary engine's number three unit, which is not a good sign. Under the remote guidance of the engine manufacturers, the crew started dismantling the engine to investigate the extent of damage. Damages to the piston, conrod, crankshaft, counterweights, and cylinder liner of the unit uh, were found. It looked like the securing bolts between the piston body and piston crown had failed, and that this may have started the damage sequence off. Anyway, spare parts were ordered, and four manufacturer's service engineers were due to attend to reassemble and overhaul the engine. While waiting for them to arrive and for repairs to commence, the ship was required to shift back to the outer anchorage. And, would you believe it, just when they completed the move, the duty engineer heard ominously abnormal noises now coming from the auxiliary engine of generator number one. Electrical load was shifted to the remaining number two generator, and the number one auxiliary engine was shut down. A lovely bonus for the service engineers who were due to arrive the next day. The number one auxiliary engine appears to have failed in a similar way to the number three engine, although uh, also in her number three unit, uh, with failure of the piston, crown bolts seeming to have started the damage sequence. Uh, in this case, the detached piston crown seems to have given the cylinder head a good bashing for good measure. In both cases, it seems very fortunate that the crankshafts have not been damaged. Investigations are underway to try to understand exactly what went wrong with the piston crown bolts. Who tightened them last? Were the correct procedures followed? Did they have some sort of metallurgical faults? And so on. If no common link is found, of course, we could be talking about two separate casualties and two deductibles. Next up, we have this nearly new chemical oil tanker that was anchored and minding her own business at a far eastern port. She was hit at her aft end by another similar tanker that was making a mess of manoeuvring with the anchorage during daylight hours. The damage was relatively slight. You can barely see it in this view with only about nine tons of steel renewals required. So she was able to continue trading. Unfortunately, from a repair cost point of view, that trading has brought her to Europe, which is where we see her now and where the owners are carrying out repairs. Had she been able to repair where she was, the costs would probably not have got to the case um, of over our threshold of two hundred a quarter of a million dollars uh, for these case reports. Here you can see the relatively minor damage uh, more clearly. It's all about the waterline too, which means that dry docking isn't needed for repairs. And here from the inside uh, of the engine room, we see the side shell longitudinals and web frames have been distorted as well, as you would expect. The damage also extends into the aft peak tank to the left of the picture. Now, you might be finding it hard to visualize uh, nine tons of damaged steel in what you have seen so far, but the permanent distortions do extend beyond the bits that are visibly bent. Also, just above the impact level, the second deck plating and under deck stiffening members in way have been pushed in and set up and will require cropping also. Alas, as our instructions were for this vessel only, we have no pictures or information on the other vessel that uh, caused all of this. Third on the list this month is this elderly Handymax bolt carrier that allegedly suffered $600,000 worth of bottom damage when entering the river channel of a South Asian port at nine o'clock one morning to dis discharge her cargo of cement clinker. This was way back in August last year. The reason we are only seeing her now is because the damage was not discovered until mid-January, when internal inspections of the ballast tanks were being carried out prior to a scheduled dry docking in the Far East for regular docking repairs. This is where we see her now. Regarding the alleged incident, the story is that an outbound vessel was drifting too far to the wrong side of the entrance channel to that South Asian port and that the local pilot on board our vessel here 
altered course to port to avoid a collision. Alas, the vessel ended up on the ground in the shallows and had to wait for the tide to rise and the assistance of a couple of harbour tugs to get her free and back to the anchorage to assess the, situa the situation. The crew checked all the machinery steering components, as well as sounding all the ballast tanks. No water ingress or other problems were found. Divers went down and carried out a touch and feel assessment as there was, no, there was zero visibility in the port waters. No obvious hull damage was detected, apart from some bending of the bilge keels. On that basis, the vessel was allowed in support to discharge her cargo using her own cranes and was then allowed to continue her commercial voyages until her actual condition was revealed in January this year. So, back to the present. In total, there is about 35 tonnes of steel renewal required and 14 additional days in the dry dock, beyond the scheduled repairs the owner had previously prepared for. Here we can see setup and distortions at the turn of bilge in the number four water ballast tank on the port side. And here, cropping in that area has commenced. Similar setup was found in way of the number three WBT on the starboard side. And here we see some of the distortions to the bilge keels on the starboard side. In this picture, we see repairs underway. Here, new turn of bilge plating on the starboard side, waiting for finishing off and coatings. And here, reconstructions proceeding with the number four WBT on the port side. Although included in the damage quantum, the owners have decided to leave some minor damages unrepaired for now, presumably in the interest of getting the ship back into service as quickly as possible. Here you can see a little dent in the side shell and some bending to the bilge keels on the port side that have not been repaired. Investigations are still underway in this case to verify, or otherwise, whether the damages now seen actually occurred during the known incident in August. It's important to establish the timing of damage for coverage reasons, of course. My reading of the situation is that some aspects of the damage, especially the damages on the starboard side, don't seem to fit very well with the description of a grounding where you would have expected the port side to have been predominantly affected. However, further clarifications and explanations may well come through in due course as the investigation proceeds. Okay, this 10-year-old Panamax bulk carrier was on a laden voyage between ports in North America uh, when an engine vibration alarm sounded, followed by a bilge alarm, and then a fire alarm, and then, for good measure, a steering gear alarm also. This alarm sequence actually quite nicely describes the sequence of events that had occurred, although exactly what had happened was not fully appreciated by the crew at the time. What they did know was that the vessel had lost propulsion and that the rudder was not responding and was seemingly stuck at eight degrees to port. And, oh yes, uh, that water was entering the engine room at a considerable rate via the stern tube seal. Thankfully, they managed to control and limit the flooding by using the emergency build suction system. Uh, that is, using the main engine cooling water pumps to draw on the flood water in the bilges and pump it directly over the side. The vessel was now drifting and effectively not under command. The local Coast Guard took her under tow with mixed success, and she was handed over to a commercial towing company a few days later. Seven days after the propulsion failure, she was safely anchored at a potential repair port for inspections and investigations, which is where we see her now. One of the tugs remained on standby. So divers went down to see exactly what was going on. No hull damages were sighted, but the propeller and tail shaft were noted to have shifted afterwards by about six inches, and the propeller was now jammed up against the rudder. It seemed clear at this point that tail shaft had fractured um, uh, somewhere within the stern tube. They didn't know exactly where uh, it was here in way of the aft bearing sleeve until later. You'll notice that the design of the rudder has a water flow bulb fairing on it and the propeller has a special fairing cap over its securing nut that, that directs flow from the propeller hub onto the rudder bulb. 
This arrangement uh, reduces the production of a vortex from the propeller hub and thereby increases the efficiency of the propeller itself. This only really works, of course, when the rudder is amidships, which, to be fair, is most of the time. But the arrangement means that the clearance between the rudder and the propeller is small. Even though the propeller fairing cap was broken off in this incident, the proximity of the rudder probably saved the propeller from being lost in this case. While at the anchorage, temporary repairs were carried out to stem the water ingress and prepare the vessel for possible onward towage for permanent repairs. Here we see the tail shaft aft of the intermediate bearing having been secured against any movement. They managed to reduce the rate of ingress to just a minor leak. During inspe inspections, they, were found, um, they found that the intermediate shaft bearing had been compromised with the cap lifted, though not as much as this, as a result of the holding down bolts being broken. Thinking about the sequence of events, this is perhaps not surprising. The, the vibration or shock during the final rapid stages of fracture of the shaft would have likely been quite intense. And when the fracture was complete, the alignment and support loads on the shaft system would have been completely out of balance due to the sudden loss of the weight of the propeller, all 23 tons of it. During their investigations, owners were also able to get a camera into the stern tube and confirm the presence of the fracture and its location as well. As no shipyard would be able to dry dock the ship with its cargo on board, the cargo had to be transshipped. Here we see the uh, lightering vessel alongside and our vessel's uh, own conveyor system transferring the cargo of sand and gravel. With the discharge complete, here we see the rudder indeed stuck at eight degrees to port. So a little bit of good news is that the rudder stock does not seem to have been twisted, but whether it is bent in any way as a result of the bearing load from the propeller has yet to be established. In the end, the vessel did manage to get a slot in the local shipyard, which is where we see her now in dry dock. If you look, look closely, you can see that rigging has been attached to the pad eyes on the hull to support the weight of both the propeller and the rudder separately. Obviously, if they had just taken the rudder off without thinking, the propeller would have fallen onto the dock floor, which wouldn't have looked good. In this view, you can actually see that they have started to remove the rudder, but in a sensibly controlled way. Here is another view of the same stage. Now the rudder is removed completely and they are removing the securing nut to release the propeller from the broken end of the tail shaft. I understand that at this stage, the broken end of the tail shaft is also being in, supported inside the stern tube, which they have cut in uh, into from the aft peak tank. The stern tube was already damaged beyond repair as a result of the catastrophic failure of the shaft and the spinning of the broken ends and the, uh, after the fracture. And here we see the aft end of the tail shaft removed, waiting for metallurgists to have a good look at the fracture surface. A bit later, the inner end of the tail shaft was released from the muff coupling in the engine room and extracted through the stern tube as well. The fractured end is on the right uh, and you can see that the fracture surface is not a nice clean break straight across the shaft. Here you can see two fracture surfaces compared side by side and metallurgists will be studying these carefully to try to establish the root cause of failure. The orientation of a fracture like this and the different patterns uh, and effects that are visible on a fracture surface, including extents of corrosion, can show where damage or fatigue crack first started to develop and how started to develop and how it progressed and over what period, and also where final brittle, fra brittle fracture uh, took place. All this is essential information for a root cause analysis, but we won't try to anticipate here the findings of the metallurgists who have been appointed. Regarding repairs, I understand the parts for a replacement stern tube assembly are not readily available, and the stern tube aperture will have to be sealed so that the vessel can be refloated and put at a lay-by berth until they are ready. 
Depending on scheduling, the vessel may need to be towed to another shipyard for the final reassembly. As well as a new stern tube, they will need a new tail shaft with stern tube bearing seals, uh, bearings and seals, and the rudder and its pins will have to be checked and repaired as necessary. The intermediate shaft bearing will have to be dismantled and overhauled, and the intermediate shaft will have to be checked for straightness and alignment. The balance of the propeller will need to be checked and checks will have to be carried out um, on all components of the propeller shaft back to the engine, such as the shaft generator and gears, the main engine bearings and the torsional vibration damper. Not surprising then that we are looking at several millions worth of repair plus towing costs and a long uh, period before the ship can get back into service. There are other interesting aspects to this case, which aren't really appropriate to talk about as the investigations are still underway. But maybe we can come back to these uh, at a later date. Okay, and finally for this month, let's look at this 10-year-old general cargo, cargo vessel that has suffered $320,000 worth of damage to five of her tween deck pontoons. Just for orientation, here is a midship section drawing showing the very flexible arrangements of this vessel. She has three holds and two cranes. She, she can carry containers in all holds and on the latch uh, hatch covers. Or she can carry bagged, bulk or general cargoes in the holds. In this picture, which does not directly relate to the incident in question, she is carrying heavy steel coils on her tank top and two tween decks have been formed using the movable pontoons that the ship is equipped with. More cargo can be carried here, but it would be, uh, have to be lighter at these tween deck pontoons um, because they're not as strong as the tank top. The drawing to the right shows an expanded plan view of one of the six pontoons that can be used at each level in each uh, hold to form a tween deck. Now, at the time of the damage that occurred to the tween deck, Pontoons of hold number two, the pontoons were not actually being used to create a tween deck. Instead, I understand that we uh, that they were being stored on the tank top of hold number two and thereby formed a sort of false floor. A cargo of 3466 big bags of high calcium quicklime was then loaded on top of them in hold two and off they went onto a voyage from North to South America. Sadly, after they discharged the cargo, they found that five of six pontoons had suffered structural collapse. In order to understand the pictures that are coming up, let's try to appreciate how these pontoons work in terms of transmitting weight uh, and loading into the sides of the ship. I don't know if, they, if you are particularly interested in this, uh, but for the one person in the room or online who might be, I feel we might have to go through this. So expanding the drawing of the pontoon a bit more, view B shows the main transverse oriented girders at the fore and aft end of each pontoon. View C then shows the arrangement of the stiffening of the plating that effectively transfers the weight of any cargo on the plating to those two main transverse oriented girders, B, which then carry the load to the pontoon support points on the inner uh, sides of the hold. So there is a distinct load path. Pressure and point loadings on the plating are transmitted to the 10 small section, trans, uh, small section transversely oriented minor stiffeners. These stiffeners transfer the load into the five longitudinally aligned short girders, which then in turn transfer the total load to the to two main transverse girders, which in their turn transfer the load to the ship sides. Okay, now we are ready to see and understand exactly what went wrong. Here we see pontoon C4. It's being supported at its ends, or rather its sides, by two other pontoons on the tank top. A ladder has been placed across its shorter span to illustrate the distortion to the plate um, that had occurred. You can see by the reflections of the ladder on the wet surface of the pontoon that the whole panel has collapsed downwards. Here's a closer view showing the extent of the downward collapse. Pontoon C5 has similar problems. With a maximum permanent deflection of about five inches. 
Pontoon C6, likewise. It appears that all the pontoons have collapsed predominantly between the main girders on the sides. The main girders themselves, though, have remained reasonably straight, although with local distortions. You can perhaps understand why from the pontoon you can see in the background that is sitting on the tank top as they were during, as they were during the voyage. The tank top itself directly supported those uh, outer girders of the pontoons. But there was no direct support for the five secondary girders which have been overloaded, tripped sideways and bent. This view shows the tripping that had occurred uh, more clearly, which, when it happened, <clears throat> would have significantly, significantly weakened the beams, ability to carry a vertical load and would have led to further vertical collapse if they hadn't had the tank top below to limit the deflection. In terms of our knowledge of the load path, we can see that the plating and the smaller section stiffeners seem to have successfully carried their share of the load without failing. The short longitudinal girders, however, have not. Had the cargo been loaded on the pontoons suspended as a proper tween deck, we may well have seen catastrophic collapse of the main girders as well. Investigations are still ongoing to check what the effective loading was uh, on the tween deck pontoons for the bagged cargo. If this was within the allowable loading limit for the pontoons in terms of max maximum allowable tons per square meter, then the design strength of the pontoons will have to be checked. However, as the vessel is 10 years old and there's no mention of any abnormal sea conditions during the voyage, it seems more likely to have been a problem um, of cargo weight and distribution rather than that of design. Having said that though, structures are often designed to have incrementally greater strength as you move through the low path, such that you might have expected or perhaps preferred that the plating and minor stiffeners would deform first with the short longitudinal girders holding their own for a little while longer. That doesn't seem to have been the case here. Anyway, I know you would love to talk about structures a lot more, but we must leave it there for now. I hope you have found these cases interesting. Um, there was a nice fire and explosion case in late February too, which is on this month's list, uh, but we'll have to keep that uh, for next month. Okay, I'll now hand back over to Mark to close off. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jasper, and thank you, Adam. Sorry, we've ever run a little bit on time today, but um, I think you'll agree with me that it was worth it. It was all very interesting. Um, just another reminder, here's our QR code for the feedback, um, and we'd really appreciate it if you could help us out with this. Um, nobody got the question right last month, so I'm afraid there's no champagne, there's no chocolate, um, nobody for nothing. For, so I didn't have to go to the supermarket this morning on the way to work. Um, so pay, I hope you paid attention today and we'll be sending out the questions with our feedback form. So we'll see if anyone wins it next month. Um, our next briefing will take place on Thursday, the 13th of April, same time here at the old Lloyd's library. Um, so watch out on our website and our social media feeds for more details. And we hope to see you all here back next month. Thank you very much. And thank you to our presenters.